Hello and welcome to episode 38 of the Physique Development Podcast, a podcast bringing you structured Q&As, deep dives on single topics, and inside looks at our team. And in today's episode, we are back with another installment of the Muscle Group series. And in this series, we take a deep dive on specific muscles each and every episode. You will learn the function of a specific muscle, common training mistakes, and misconceptions about that muscle group, go-to exercises, and why we personally program them for clients, and we'll also include some key execution cues to nail down your technique. Today's episode, we are going to cover the muscles of the upper arms, this being the biceps and triceps. We're going to talk about where they are, what they do, and how we train them. And as I always do on these muscle group series episodes, I like to sort of have a note or a caveat saying, we are not going to exhaust these explanations and anatomical structures. We are doing our best to give you the tools for a better understanding of the anatomy, your training in any given training session. Okay, so if you wanna learn more, get an anatomy book, go get the Complete Anatomy app. Um, there's a lot of great resources out there. Um, and we have some information in the show notes about uh, learning more about all this stuff as well. All right, so. That kind of covers the intro here. I'm going to hand it off to Alex, and we're kind of going to dive into the biceps first. All right. So within the biceps, I have a, a fun fact for you guys to utilize next time you're around all of your, your gym going friends is that uh, the biceps are called the, the brachii, which is the lat or in Latin is uh, two headed muscle of the arm. So um, obviously it works accordingly to, to what it truly is. And it is representing the short and the long head of the bicep. The biceps attach across two joints the elbow and the shoulder, and its core function is to uh, create elbow flexion or flex at the elbow and uh, supinate the wrist. The biceps are a small muscle group and they are a, a pivotal piece within the functionality of the arm as a whole. And um, anytime that you are, are picking something up, whether it be the, the groceries and you are um, showcasing to your significant other how many that you can carry, this is going to be a, a helpful muscle group for that. Or um, if you're putting your luggage in the overhead in the, in the plane, that is going to be a, a helpful uh, muscle to get that in there. But um, it has a, a lot of, of just general application to your day-to-day -day within the functionality of, of tasks that you would do. And then also it is going to serve as a muscle group that is um, the, the first one that people kind of uh, talk about when uh, critiquing your physique, seeing that, oh, let me see how, let me see those arms. Those are some, those are some nice arms. Why don't you go ahead and, and uh, flex the, flex your bicep or, or throw up a front double bicep. It's kind of the, um, I guess the the main one that almost everyone is is familiar with. If, they, if you think of a bodybuilder and someone who is just general population is probably going to throw up a front double bicep to say uh, or or to resemble a a bodybuilder. So these this muscle specifically is going to be very important for you to get compliments probably from the the general population and know that you actually train. So it's a important uh, muscle group for you to uh, hypertrophy as a whole. Yeah, and with the uh it's definitely the the muscle you're carrying in the groceries that's going to cramp up so you know it's working um <laughs> i mine always cramps up when i when i do the the one trip uh grocery haul into the house um now that we have a new a new place we actually have a wagon now so i don't have to do that but awesome. <laughs> just yeah. i just load up the wagon and just drag yeah. it in. um which is great but so the like you were saying too the the biceps and it, it seems like the biceps and the traps are just those those muscles that if you want to kind of look like you lift you need to have arms and traps as a male um those are kind of your your go-to uh, and obviously as we preach on this show or whatever the hell this is um through our physique development we want to train everything, right? We want to be very functional and we want to be healthy and, and well-rounded and symmetrical and all those things. But all that to say, if you want to look jacked, <laughs> have bigger arms <laughs> and big traps. That's, I'm just going to leave that, leave that there. Um, and so Alex did mention the short head and the long head of the biceps. So we're going to go through the biceps first. Um, obviously we're going to talk about the triceps here later on a little bit. Um, uh, but I want to get into kind of the short head uh, and the, where those are positioned and, and all of that stuff um, a little bit more and a little bit in the nitty gritty, maybe get a little nerdy here 
um, just for a second, and then we'll kind of uh, go back out and with a broader, broader paintbrush or broader lens. So the short head, short of the bicep is positions on the inside of the upper arm and it attaches uh, up there on the scapula. It attaches to that curvy part that shoots out under the collarbone, in case you're interested, and inserts into the biceps tendon down near the elbow. Okay, so the short head is most known for its roles in elbow flexion and supination. Okay, that turning of the forearm or wrist. And we, when people talk about the short head, they're usually referring to the biceps peak, right? So if you go on YouTube and you type in anything that has to do with biceps, you're going to get people talking about grow the peak, um, do X, Y, and Z. And as we'll get into a little later, you can start to bias these heads uh, more and more uh, and be a little bit more strategic, but all that to say, um, just flex the arm, load that, train the body, just train your arms, man. Okay. That's the big thing. Um, and, and the biggest tip on growing your biceps peak is to grow your biceps in general. Um, and really kind of a, an own adage that we can try to, the peak's more like a genetic thing anyways. I mean, obviously you can grow your arms, but in terms of your insertion point and, and all of that stuff and how that goes for you, it's largely genetic in a big way. Yeah, that's what I was more so getting at. And even if you're wanting to, you're, you're seeing the, um, the post and those different factors of, of biasing the, the short head or the, the long head of the bicep, the reality is, is that 99% of people are not going to have a discrepancy of, of short and, and long head, uh, either muscular density or strength. Or even if you did, I don't know if you would even notice necessarily a, a discrepancy between strength, maybe. Um, but with it, just to say, and to reiterate the fact of like, just train your biceps, don't get too caught up in like, I have this much volume placed on the short head and I have this much volume placed on the, the long head of the, the bicep. Yeah. I mean, splitting hairs there. And it's, um, again, I have a variety. We're going to talk about variety here in a minute. Um, after I go over the, the long head of the bicep, but just having some variety in your, in your arms training, your biceps training specifically, um, it's going to really help grow both of those heads. Um, I would say fairly evenly. And obviously there's going to be some, some deviation person to person, um, some, some variability individually, uh, from person to person, but that said, it's, it's good just to train, train your arms, train them hard. <laughs> All right. Long head of the long head of the bicep here. So the long head of the biceps is positioned on the outside of the upper arm, right? So the short head was on the inside of the upper arm and the long head is on the outside of the upper arm and it attaches more to the shoulder centric part of the scapula, uh, where it's tendon actually runs smoothly through a grooved notch in the humerus bone, that upper arm bone and then inserts into the bicep tendon near the elbow alongside the short head. So with a lot of things, especially with the arms here, we're gonna have a differing attachment points um, on one side of the muscle and a lot of these fat, like, sort of filter in or kind of come all together to, to attach together to a kind of a collective tendon down near the elbow. Okay, this is, this tracks with biceps and the triceps, okay. The long head also flexes the elbow and creates supination, that turning of the forearm or wrist. So it, it shares that role uh, with the short head. And the longer head sits under the short head and when trained, helps create a thicker arm, right? So again, splitting hairs, train your arms, <laughs> work on a variety of exercises, right? It's, it's there's, there's that thing we always talk about. Alex and I always talk about this. Um, I know when, when we, are on together. It's, it's like ignorance is bliss. And it's just like the best, you know, your physique's looking pretty damn good these days, but, Thank you. um, yeah, I can't say the same for myself as far as like <laughs> relative, but I would say when my physique looked the best, it was sort of like ignorance is bliss, right? It was like, just train hard and train a lot, recover well, repeat. Right. And obviously there's a lot of, there's a lot of nuance in that. Of course. We split here. We split hairs here at physique development quite a bit. Yeah. Um, especially between amongst all, us and the way we program and the way that we coach. And, and we're obviously deep entrenched into the nuance. We're deep entrenched into sort of the splitting of those hairs. Um, but for you, the listener and for people who are just trying to really 
grow a muscle group and to train hard, it's it's just important to to do just that, just to train hard and have a good variety of exercises and enjoy the shit that you're doing. Enjoy what you're doing. I think that's a big thing. Did you want to mention anything before we go into the exercises? Yeah, I think that the the other aspect within that long head is that it is going to, as Austin spoke on with the scapula attaching there, and um, that is one thing that, like in a preacher curl, we're going to talk about this within the exercise selection, is that the individual c- will kind of like shrug up, and, and what's happening there is that we're kind of getting this... Um, momentum being generated because of the the attachment point and those different factors so understanding kind of that component where it is going to play a role in the stabilization and if if you were to select any you know training of of locking down the scapula you hear this term you know uh across the last five, six years, what have you, in terms of the bench press and those different factors, as we have worked to to not have that be the case. And and we've made that error in the past and and are seeing now within our pressing and and pulling motions that it's more of an organic movement of the the scapula going through protraction and retraction. This is actually when we're training biceps and triceps specifically, this could be a time to lock down the scapula that it would be of value to you to have better stability for the the long head and the, and the short head of the bicep specifically to to work better more so the the long head specifically yeah and i, I like um you know the cue i use for myself and and for anyone in person it's sort of it's creating stability um right in that upper back and when someone sort of tells you a cue that kind of works for me in my head is is when you know you're kind of hunched over let's say you know sitting at a desk and someone says like sit up sit up straight you kind of bring those shoulder blades back you create stability in that upper back you know you create some tension back there and that's essentially all we're wanting to do um and as the load gets greater though is when it gets increasingly more important that you have that stability back there right because we're not wanting to protract and retract and protract and retract as we're going through these arm motions um because that's going to take a lot of um some a lot of the focus and and you're going to lose some tension there uh and you're going to Honestly, I, I think create some wear and tear around uh, the shoulders um, and, and where those attachment points are. Um, and it's going to all around just take focus off kind of the work you're trying to do in general, um, just all up. So I think that's an important note uh, and, and a good one to, to mention there. So some of these some of these exercises here, uh, ones that we love. OK, so as uh, with other muscle group series episodes, uh, you can go back and listen to those. Uh, we have pretty much this is the last muscle group uh, that we're covering here as far as as of right now uh, we thought the abs were but we we remembered we forgot the arms uh how dare us and so we, we wanted to obviously hit the arms here in this episode but with with all the other ones why i mentioned that was uh, we have a playlist on our youtube channel just search physique development uh it's that youtube channel and there's playlists for all of these muscle groups through these series so you're going to see we're going to talk about these these muscle groups or we're going to talk about these exercises uh, a little bit here but we really just want you to go reference those playlists that we've put together for you um, specific to these episodes that way you can dive in you can see us explain the the exercises more you can see us walk through the, the the technique the setup the common mistakes that are made all of those things okay so i just wanted to kind of mention that there that We do have those on YouTube. So the facing in and away cable curl. Um, Now, whether you're facing in or facing away in this cable curl, it's gonna kind of alter the resistance profile. So where that that exercise is is most challenging throughout the range of motion a little bit. Uh, And and again, within the the nuance of program design, these things do kind of come into play a little bit more. And and we're gonna have increasingly more content about this stuff. And we actually have talked about it on the YouTube channel. on both we actually have two videos on the facing away cable curl uh at the moment that we that you recorded and i recorded one um as well and i mean they're both good alex is a bit shorter if you have three less minutes listen to alex's mine's obviously uh per usual a little long-winded um (laughs) but it's still good nonetheless um gets the job done so um, go and look at that, and we do t- we do start to talk about uh, the resistance profile in there a little bit of this this exercise. But we love the facing away uh, cable curl a lot, and the facing in as well. Um, one because it just lines up well with people. Yeah, it's an easy way for 
it, from an online perspective, this is the easiest way to um, create a lot of tension. Once those cables get lined up, my gosh, this becomes very easy. It's just a matter of, of stabilizing the shoulder joint and allowing for us to go through elbow flexion. And so doing those two movements specifically, um, they're targeting the tissue in different lengths, of course, but then within that, those are two of our kind of bread and butter exercises. And, um, I will say as we've gotten older and I'll speak for myself and I'm sure you'll echo this is that when we were younger training, we love training arms. So we always had a, a consistent arm day within our training and just obliterated ourselves from a volume perspective. I can't say how much of a polar opposite I am now as I'm an, an adult and, and wanting to get the most bang for my buck per session of like, I arms, if I, if it's just at the end of my session, nine times out of 10, and it's like, I've got to, you know, hype myself up a little bit to get this small bit of arm volume that I have at this point, because yeah. it's like, the, the like meat mati- yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's turning into the, the lack of calf training that it's I've always calves had as your well. Upper arm. Or the yeah. calves you got for body. Yeah. <laughs> uh, with, the, with the cable, the facing in and facing away, we also um, have video of the hammer strength, or not hammer strength, the hammer variations of this where we have a, a facing in uh, cable and then facing away, which we're not talking a ton about the, the brachialis here, which obviously is going to play a role. But um, those movements, I really like those, those two. Yeah. And, and we are missing a little bit of that brachialis, brachioridialis, um, muscles. Again, with these, we have to sort of make decisions. We don't want the episode to get too long. Of course. And so maybe we'll come back with a bonus episode on, on the smaller <laughs> the stuff, the forearms, the, you know, the tibis, tibialis anterior, yeah. uh, some of those scaling muscles, who knows, who knows what we're going to do. But, um, so there is the, you know, the brachialis that lies in the sort of the middle of that that upper arm. So right kind of the middle of that. So if you're looking at from the, the side there, it's kind of in the middle of the two, uh, between the, the biceps and the triceps rather. Um, so it kind of lies within there and growing your brachialis with hammer curl variations is a great idea. I mean, you're going to, you're going to grow your arms there. Um, and you, as you're going to see a lot online, like there's a lot of sort of like, you know, the bro bodybuilding thing of like, it helps expand your arms and beef up your, you know, whatever. Um, yeah. but it is a functional, it is a muscle. We need to train it. We need to train it with good exercises and the hammer curl variations, uh, whether it's dumbbell or this, the cable variations of those hammer curls, um, those are very important, uh, for overall functionality of the upper arm and shoulder and elbow and all of those things alongside the brachioradialis, which is kind of collectively in there as well. So we do f- we do kind of skip over those in this episode um, as far as specifics, but with that exercise selection, we do recommend adding in those uh, those hammer curl variations, which we do have uh, some of those on our YouTube. And we're constantly adding videos, so go check it out if it's not there. It may be there soon. Um, dumbbell standing or seated incline curls. So dumbbell curls, again, these are with, you know, with the world of being a purist out there, it's sort of like, you know, don't train with dumbbells. It doesn't match your arm angle. It doesn't match whatever else. And it's like, all right, man, like we're very close. We're split again, going back to splitting hairs here. We're very, very close. If it doesn't hurt, you know, like truly hurt your elbows or your shoulders, you don't feel pain during that exercise. It feels pretty good. You're getting a good pump. You're still getting good tension. All right. It's good exercise you know, it checks all the boxes in my opinion. So we still definitely use these dumbbell variations. Um, if you are a, a, a larger structure individual, um, you have very broad shoulders, uh, things like that, where you do get a lot of pain, um, or there's a, there's a pretty s- severe angle between your, your elbow and your wrist joint when you are curling and it's not lining up very well. Uh, that forearm isn't lining up very well with that upper arm as you curl. Maybe then you should do it unilaterally, but, um, you know, there, there is a caveat there. Uh, so if you are a very, a larger structured individual, broad shoulders, things like that, and, or have a very sort of severe angle between that elbow and wrist joint, when you curl, there's some merit definitely to the unilateral component of that. Um, so you'll see that being done. And, and that is, a, that is one we recommend if you are kind of fit that, fit that structure, but being a very normal sized person myself, um, you know, I have decently wide shoulders in general in terms of my structure and I, I can still get away with doing 
you know, both arms at the same time doing bilateral curls. So if I can do it, I'd say a lot of people can probably get away with it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I agree. And I think that the, the next exercise that we have on here within the, the chin ups being more eccentrically loading, man, Oof, this is a, a way to yeah blow up your biceps here. Um, done properly. My gosh, this is a hellacious pump for one. And then two, yeah. from a fatigue perspective, be sure that you're not training arms again after this for our biceps specifically, uh, for a good bit of time, you know, following this session, because you're going to have some days, you're going to need four <laughs> yeah, or five days some to lingering recover. fatigue, especially yeah. for your first time. You have to think that you're maybe doing a three or four second eccentric load and your body mass is, is the resistance. Thus it is going to be a, a stout curl in terms of if you were to, for myself being 210 pounds, if I was to have a, an easy bar and try to do that, that would be, I mean, that would be ridiculous. And so understanding that, especially when you're picking your rep range, because if you're thinking for, for general purposes within bicep training, more often than not, you're thinking like eight to 12 repetitions for most individuals. I'm not so sure. Like uh, the last time it was programmed I in for me, four. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no. it was four. Yeah. And I had like three sets and I was like, I, I had texted Adam of like, dude, I don't know about this third set here. Like two was yeah, yeah, sufficient yeah. for me. Like this was, this was enough for me. Yeah, and you can sort of deload it too. Like I like to do with uh, dips, which we have a, a video on this on our channel um, under the training tips category at the very bottom of the homepage there on the, the Physique Development YouTube channel. And it's using a box, assisted eccentrics essentially, using a box on dips, um, like under your feet. And you could do the same thing here with this variation. Uh, you can do it with pull-ups in general, but chin-ups in general. Um, but I like the box in this specific situation because, you know, I like to sort of have that there as I do start to fatigue a little bit more. And I uh, like maybe when I hit rep three or four and I'm like, ah, oh, dude, I couldn't do another one, you know, be it, you know, we're around the same weight here. So doing that for four reps and doing it, thinking about doing a fifth one, it's like, no, I don't think so without, without some help. So having that box there, allow your feet to sort of displace some weight or deload some weight off of that and uh continue to you probably will get another two to three reps out of it so um again this is where nuance of program design does come in a little bit and i know we're gonna have some episodes coming up uh, more specifically and we've had some questions through youtube as well so thank you for those if you do have questions we want that you want answered on the show um or whatever this is the podcast <laughs> um then do ask them uh, on youtube and we, we do see those so uh, but a question that has been asked is about program design there, but there is some nuances here with program design that's, you know, this exercise specifically that we, that we, what we were talking about here with the, the eccentric focused chin up for biceps is like, you need some time to recover, Yeah, you know, because <clears throat> there's going to be a lot of muscular damage, a lot of mechanical damage done, um, a lot of fatigue driven, uh, in that. So it's very important that you understand that and you know you don't have any you know this is something we'd have to think you know like when when you and i were doing the inflatables thing it's like dude i don't know if i could do that job at that moment you know there are days that i was just so sore from our training that i was like yeah i honestly don't think i can do my job today like i don't think i'm gonna be able to lift this up <laughs> i don't think i'm gonna yeah. hold this um <clears throat> trying to get those things back on the dollies it's just like dude i don't <clears throat> i don't i don't know i don't think so so do take that into consideration. Yeah. And this could be another whole podcast for you guys of kind of going over what eccentric loading really does within your training and, and having the resistance of that and um, how different the emphasis on that would apply to your training. We could, that would be a whole other episode, but that would be a, maybe an interesting topic for us to kind of delve into uh, for you guys. You can't break that down in 60 seconds. <laughs> no, I don't think so. <laughs> no, I don't think so. Um, I don't think so. And the last one here we have is, is preacher curls. Um, so preacher curls are fantastic exercise. One of my favorites. I'm a huge fan of the machine based one. Um, you can do a preacher curl using a bench with dumbbells, uh, single arm more unilateral work. Uh, but, and then there's also the preacher curl bench that you can do free weight with dumbbells as well. You can do it unilaterally or bilaterally with both arms. Uh, but my favorite by far, I love, love, love the preacher curl machine uh, for biceps. Uh, be it that, you know, obviously it's not a, a crap machine, but 
you know, obviously if, if you can get into a gym where there's like a life fitness one or um, maybe even like a pre-core one or, you know, some of the hammer strength ones are all right. And obviously the prime is sort of that pinnacle um, of preacher curl machines in, in my opinion. Uh, and you obviously can change the resistance profile on that one even, even so. So love the, love the machine based preacher curl as far as like driving anywhere from low reps to high reps really um, in that. So big fan. Yeah, big fan. I think that the, the two movements, if we were to speak on a lower rep range that I utilize the most within programming, it would be the facing away uh, cable curl. And I'll use that into, um, for some of our male competitors, I'll, I'll even get down to like four repetitions on that. Uh, with a lot of our females, if I'm utilizing it within their training, the lowest I would probably go would be six. And the same thing goes within the preacher curl. Um, those two are the the ones of that I would probably take the lowest repetition allotments on. And then everything else I would say, um, higher repetition allotments and, um, yeah. Yeah. And those, so the, I would say that every, ep oh, every the exercise, we, yeah, the chin well, every well. exercise we, yeah, that's a lower rep one as well. Yeah. Obviously we talked about that, but, um, obviously depending on your structure, you know, if you weigh 90 pounds and you're, you're super, super strong, more. like, you know, who knows sky's the limit. Yeah. Um, but, the facing in and away cable curls, the, the dumbbell standing or seated curls, preacher curls, those, those are ones that you can use with a multitude in a, in a very large range of, of reps uh, in rep schemes and, and uh, all of that stuff, rest periods, you name it. You can really, you can do a lot with those bread and butter exercises in terms of program design and, and really training that muscle group. Um, and then obviously there's, you know, there's more arm exercises on the channel. I, I just want to plug that really quick again before we move on to triceps, because you know if you there's kind of exercises that are a little bit more long head specific and short head specific that have to do with the cables and stuff like that, um, like a high cable curl or, or things like that. Um, but we won't get into that just because it if, unless you're seeing it in front of you, it can be a little confusing to explain. So um, those are on the channel, great videos. Um, so go check those out. Uh, any other notes that we wanted to add on biceps before moving on to triceps here? I don't believe so. I think we're ready for for my personal favorite. I feel like when we f first yeah. got started training, this was the uh, this your thing. the the muscle group that I was like, I want my triceps to be massive. I had seen a photo of Lee Priest. Um, oh, wow. His triceps yeah. were were crazy. It was his it was his legs and his triceps were really his <laughs> his main pieces. Um, yeah. And his, his triceps were cross straight. I mean, they were crazy looking. Um, yeah. and so that was kind of the, the first example. And so within the, the tricep, you're going to have three muscles and obviously coming from the name being tri, um, you're going to have the lateral head of the, uh, tricep, which is going to be that, um, I mean, it's moving laterally at the, the outer portion of the tricep, if you will, then you're going to have the medial head, which is going to, to under or lie under the, the other two heads, if you will. And then you're going to have the, that meaty portion of the tricep being the long head of the tricep, which is going to run alongside the, um, the inner portion of the arm. And all three of these muscles attach at your elbow and are responsible for extending your arm which opposes the action of the flexor, such as the bicep that we just uh, covered. The tricep, it makes up about two thirds of your arm. So you're going to hear repetitively, if you're wanting to grow your arms, train the shit out of your triceps, yeah. um, which I think that there's obviously some validity to that, but I don't think that it's like, you should have 20 sets of tricep volume and then 10 sets of bicep volume. I don't, I don't think that you need to bias it that much. I think that with both muscle groups, you're going to need to just have a, everything that we drive home quality execution exercise that line up well for you and you can execute extremely well and you're going to see the growth that's necessary with the other you know components taken into place uh from a program design and and all of that fun stuff um the last thing that i want to touch on from the uh, training component of things is that um the, the primary function is to extend the arm as i spoke about and then also within the exercises that's what the 
overarching goal is obviously going to be is to get into extension of the elbow uh, to allow for us to train the tricep through uh, different ranges that we are, are targeting. And, and Austin's going to give you um, the details on all the, the meteor aspects of the tricep. Yeah, getting nerdy for a bit. So <laughs> as we discussed previously, right, the triceps do have three heads, tri meaning three, set meaning head, three heads, and attach across the upper arm and onto the scapula. Okay, <clears throat> so the long head, right, that inner meaty portion of <laughs> the back of the arm attaches to the scapula and does have some involvement in that glenohumeral joint or that shoulder joint. Um, yeah, you know, it, it's tough to, there's people who are a lot smarter than us that, that can break this down a little, I think a little bit uh, more eloquently, but as a whole, you know, like saying biceps are, um, and there, there's definitely some research to, to back this up to, um, that I've dug into, but like the biceps, you know, aren't as much elbow or shoulder flexors as they are sort of shoulder fixators, right? So they, they sort of resist. So if you had your arm up into shoulder flexion, let's say, um, like at the end of like a, like if you're throwing a baseball up in the air let's say, and you're at the top of that movement, right? And someone came and tried to like force your arm down really quickly, right? Your bicep's sort of gonna help fixate that arm in place, sort of fixate that position um, and resist that downward motion, right? And so I think the same is very similar for the triceps in that they're sort of, uh, you know, obviously gonna help, they're gonna do what they do as far as shoulder extension goes, um, but I, I, they're not a main shoulder extender. Right, so when you when you see these these really integrated tricep push down shoulder extension movements, like anytime we're trying to make a muscle do multiple functions at one time, you're muddy in the water here, right? So choose a goal, choose an exercise for that goal, and drive that point home, right? If you want to train the the other function of that, train it sort of on its own, um, and, and you're going to be able to train that in other shoulder extension exercises if if it has merit. Um, but that is to say that long head does attach to the scapula. Um, there is some function there, but probably more from a stability standpoint than, than anything, right? A stability standpoint at the shoulder and the, and the elbow, uh, as well. Okay. So the, that's the long head, the meaty inner portion, <laughs> yeah. medial and lateral head. Okay. The other two heads spanning across outwardly from the, the middle to the lateral out to the outside of the arm. And both of these sort of creates that horseshoe, right? There's sort of the, the two on the outside and there's one that kind of in the middle that's deep, um, kind of creating that horseshoe effect. Uh, and so the medial and lateral, both of these heads attached to the back of the upper arm bone, that humerus, okay? And although they do share a very similar attachment point uh, towards the upper portion of that upper arm, uh, the medial head lies deeper than the lateral head, right? That we kind of went over. So they do attach in a very similar place. Um, so that outer portion of the tricep does attach very similarly to where the medial portion does attach, um, but the, the medial actually falls under and is, lies deeper um, to, to that compared to that lateral head. So, and then as I mentioned earlier, a little bit, a lesser known function of the biceps and triceps is going to be shoulder stability. Uh, so as the long head of each muscle, the biceps and the triceps attach to the scapula, this aids in uh, humeral displacement, stability uh, as a whole, right? And so there's there's a lot of merit to, to having strong biceps and triceps and training through a broad range of motion, through different movement patterns, things like that, because you're not just growing big arms, you're growing very functional joints as well. Um, and that's a very important thing as you want to steer clear of injury and, and do all of that stuff uh, through or across your training career and staying in the gym, right? Because as we always talk about here is if we're not staying in the gym, right? The benefits are only as good as, as we are consistent, right? Um, so you, you know, the benefits you got when you were in your twenties, you're not hanging on to those when you're in your forties and fifties, right? You got to continue to, you got to keep at it. You got to stay in the gym, right? We have to stay healthy and we want to have strong joints. So training all these things through a broad range of motion and through a variety of exercises is a great idea. <clears throat> Anything to add there? Yeah. I think the one thing I would add within the stability component is that within contact sports, this is it 
having very strong delts and having very strong bicep and tricep and, and forearm strength it looks great within the jerseys, uh, within basketball and football, but it has a lot of performance applications in terms of going up to uh, as a receiver going up to get a ball like a jump ball in that fashion where the defender is is pulling down on, on that arm where Austin already talked about that the bicep um, being a, a stabilizer to be able to you know go up and get that ball and stay up there even with someone pulling down and same thing goes for getting rebounds as a, a basketball player there's a lot of functionality and performance uh, that athletes especially in contact sports are going to benefit from training uh, their biceps and triceps well yeah and i even i even see it in snowboarding mm. um you know so strength in the extremes is a, is a good thing and um again that, that kind of goes back to training through a broad range of motion because in being stronger in those those uh more end end ranges of motion or or yeah more extreme muscle links short and lengthened um as well through the mid-range but like when I'm snowboarding and I'm trying to, you know, to cut really hard or carve really hard or, or to turn really, really hard. Um, or if I go back on my back and you know, I kind of plant my arm down or I lose balance and I need to plant my arm down to sort of gain, regain some balance. There's been times where it's like, I think if I had a super weak bicep, things would have went really wrong <laughs> because <laughs> my arm was kind of extended beyond, uh, back beyond, behind me. And I, I felt some, you know, I felt a pull in my bicep when I put my arm down, put my hand down. And I think due to the strength and integrity of those joints, um, I was able to, you know, to, to not get injured in that moment. But I do think if that was super weak or I didn't train or, you know, I wasn't strong in those positions or at least strong enough in those positions, I think that would have been a, a recipe for disaster for myself. So uh, there's a lot of application uh, into obviously into real life outside of the gym, right? Um, muscles are great for show, but we also want them to work in real life uh, and in sports, which is, you know, obviously if you're listening to this, you play sports, um, we have exciting things coming up for you, but yeah. um, uh, in the future here, but that, that all said there, it's it's very important to to train these, these muscle groups through, through that wide range of motion, variety of exercises, all that stuff. So let's get into, um, let's get into exercises. Uh, because I think that's going to be a good, good transition here. And um, so triceps, so just like biceps, you know, you're, you're also hitting your biceps in, in more compound base, base movements like rowing and, and pull downs and, and things like that, right? Those pulling movements, you're also hitting your biceps. So, you know, pressing movements, you're hitting your triceps, right? And so, and you'll notice this, you know, I, I remember when Alex and I were first going through uh, the principles program back when we wrote that, uh, was it 2018? Gosh, yeah. A minute. We kind of first wrote that. Um, and so we were going through that and there's pressing after some pretty intense tricep work. And if you want to understand how much the triceps are involved in pressing, go through the principles program and about three fourths of the way through <laughs> With that first workout, you hit triceps. It may be the first workout in general. Um, you're gonna really, really understand how involved those triceps are in pressing because I think it's an it's an overhead press that we went through and it was like we were supposed to like four sets. <laughs> After the third one, I was like, oh, dude, I'm toast. I'm I can't. Done. Yeah, I can barely extend my arm here. Um, so we're not going to touch on any. You know, there I, there's a mention. You know, pressing horizontal and overhead. Uh, work the triceps, but we're not going to go specifically into that stuff right now, but do understand there is a heavy involvement. Um, so if you're doing a ton of pressing, you know, start to calculate that as far as, you know, the volume you, you may be doing for that muscle, that muscle group. Um, and also it kind of comes into play too, you know, don't trash your triceps the day before a pressing session, you know, probably not a great idea because there's a lot of carryover. Um, and I would say if you do hit arms or you, you kind of do trash your arms or triceps and you have a, <clears throat> you have a, a push session coming up or, you know, a chest session coming up or something where you have a lot of pressing, at least give yourself a day to recover in that. Right. So the arms are going to recover fairly quickly, depending on what, how you smash them. Um, but at least give your, yourself a day there to recover because there is, there are a lot of overlap within those other upper body movements, but um, so this first, this first exercise that we have specifically more of isolation movements for the, the triceps, 
um, one that we love. You see it everywhere. Um, you're starting to see it everywhere, but we love it. It's the cross cable tricep extension. Favorite. Yeah. Yeah. Big fan. Huge favorite. It's, uh, I, I think the beauty of it is, is how, again, the cables line up with the, the joints and how we're training them. I think that especially coming from a, a place where, uh, a lot of the the rope attachments that many people utilize in their gym and it just don't align well with the individual and it kind of puts you in this like hunched over turtle shell positioning and you're not really fully training the triceps um and so getting into this cable and and allowing for the cross cable to transpire it just feels i mean significantly better tension is obviously um significantly better all those different factors yeah yeah all around a great exercise trains you know, all three heads, um, in a great way. Um, it's very functional and yeah, it does a great job at creating a lot of tension. You can load it, you can do it high reps, you can do it low reps, you can do it short rest periods, you can do it, you name it, um, as a superset, whatever you can, you can do a lot with that cross cable tricep extension. So, and also with body structures and, and all that stuff, again, whether you're a small structure or, or a larger structure, you can again manipulate where you can manipulate the resistance to line up with your body parts your arm angle and all that stuff way easier with cables obviously than you can with free weights okay so that's why a lot of these recommendations are cable based um, that we make especially when it comes to arm training because the more that it does line up the more advantageous that is for creating maintaining tension but also not putting a ton of you know tension passive tension through those there's connective tissues and, and causing injury in the future and stuff like that, um, which we don't want. And then the the sort of the flip side of that coin is the, the overhead tricep extension um, where you're facing away from the cable and you're kind of cross cable still, but you're kind of more overhead facing away. Um, again, there all of these are on YouTube if you want to look at that YouTube channel. All of these are on YouTube if you need explanations or you want visuals of these. Um, I'd highly recommend that because um, we do go through everything. Uh, but that's another great one. And I know there's, you know, there's another one that uh, we're starting to see more of, which is more of that, I guess that more of that medial head that you do training more specifically with more of an adjustable functional trainer, but we don't have a video on that quite yet. So I don't want to go too deep into that. Right. And the, like the next one being the skull crusher, skull crusher is kind of just like nostalgic because it was oh, kind of the, yeah, yeah, it's like, I, I, I don't know that it's necessarily the best tricep exercise. Like I, I'm, I'm aware of that, but in terms of just like it being part of our training from literally, you know, 14 years old, it's like, I just, I do it out of, um, yes, it's a good exercise, but two, it just feels nostalgic every time that I get into that exercise for whatever reason, um, because it's one exercise that has just stayed in our training for, I mean, literally such a long time, like a decade and a half, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. And then, yeah, it's been in our training forever. I remember, I mean, back when, you know, Wildeman was training us, uh, <laughs> yeah. in, in strength conditioning and then all, you know, all the way to, you know, old old you know you can go back in old our first yeah like 2013 14 youtube window. videos where we're we're doing it yeah. right we're, we've been doing the skull crusher forever and I, again it's a nostalgic exercise it's a good one it's good bang for your buck um if it doesn't hurt your elbows or your shoulders dude i'm game do it um but if it if you do get some pain or you know sometimes you get some some clicking um you get a little resistance or pain in the elbow i get um, <clears throat> so there's some days I feel like, I'm not even sure what that is to be honest, but there's some days where <clears throat> the, the skull crusher is like, yes, today's it. we're loading, we're loading this up. Yeah. Um, and then there's some days where I, I can't even, you know, I pick up, you know, 15, 20 pound weights. I'm trying to do dumbbell skull crushers. And it's like, not today, man. It's just, you know, like when you go, it's like on a hack squat, you know, sometimes, <clears throat> sometimes for me, like <clears throat> as I'm going down through the eccentric on my first rep of a hack squat or, or a pendulum squat or something. And, you know, you kind of get that knee strain, that knee pain and that patellar tendon or something or around the knee. And it's just like, not today. Today's not it. I don't know what, what I did to the knee. I don't know what I did to the elbow, but just not today. Yeah. I think it's just a, a matter of, 
crazy use that we've had over the past however many years from an athletic perspective. (laughs) And I think there's just days. Yeah. I think there's just days where my body's like, nah, not today, man. Like we've, we've done this a billion times. So I'm going to, I'm going to pass today and, and let you, you know, figure out what, what else you want to do. Yeah. And that, I think that brings up an important point as you know, we're kind of rounding out our exercise list here. And again, if you want a f- more full list, YouTube, go to YouTube, great resource for you. That's why it's there. Um, and that's why we put so much work into it. Uh, so you guys can go look at it and, and learn. But I think that's a good transition into, um, you know, a quick point that <clears throat> if something isn't feeling great, change. You know, and it may be just be for that session. It may be for the the phase. It may be for the foreseeable future, right? There's movements that we used to do that we don't do anymore just because they don't feel very good. Um, you know, and and I feel like some of those exercises, I'm more sore in my joints than I am in my muscle, which is not the goal. Um, and so if, if that's the case, you're getting a lot of wear and tear on those joints. You're not feeling great. Um, <clears throat> you know, and, and after a tough session, you obviously may have a little joint pain, especially if you're a little detrained or whatever else. Connective tissue is a little bit longer to adapt, takes a bit longer to adapt than compared to muscle. But if you are well-trained and you've been training consistently and you just, after tough sessions, you have more aches and pains in your joints relative to your muscles, we need to start to rethink some exercise selection a little bit. Um, and and don't, be, don't be afraid to, I think it's why it's great too to have more, more exercises in your arsenal and understanding understanding the anatomy and the function of, of that anatomy uh, insofar that you can really start to add variety to your training, right? You can start to add variety to, <clears throat> to your program design in that, you know, if something doesn't feel great, it's like, okay, well, I understand what I'm trying to get done here. I know that I can do, there's two other exercises that I can do to train this muscle the way I'm trying to train it, you know, and option one and two aren't feeling great today. So let's do option three, which is great, a great way to do it. Yeah. I think that especially for individuals who maybe travel for work or travel consistently from a um, pleasure perspective or what have you, starting from a base of anatomy is going to be so helpful as you're getting into gyms that you're not familiar with, or you're in a um, hotel gym that has a, a functional trainer and dumbbells up to 50. I mean, that's 90% of hotels you can get that you're done. in. I mean, you can get a ton done. Yeah. When I was just in town for the, the company gathering, our yearly company gathering, uh, you know, that, that, uh, that Marriott had a, you know, a, a gym with weights that went up to dumbbells that went up to 50 and a functional trainer. And it was like, I can get everything done I want to get done here. Yeah. It was perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I know that when we go to hotels and I see that, that gives me just an assurance that I can really train whatever I need to train if I'm in there by myself. It does get a little <laughs> a little challenging. If, if there's two there's people another, in there, it's, it's <laughs> yeah, a little challenging. It becomes a little tough yeah. and you're not doing yeah. the same thing or what have you. Um and so that's, you know, it, coming from a place of anatomy for those who travel a bunch becomes, I mean, so um, uh, valuable in, in general. So, yeah, I, I agree. So on, on to some questions there. So <clears throat> I, I wanted to, to sort of round this episode out with a few questions more specific uh, to how we're choosing these exercises, right? So when it comes down to exercise selection, um, whether that be for, for some competitors or program design or whatever else. So let's get into those questions. So Alex, uh, my first question to you is how have you been, uh, most recently approaching your arm focused exercise selection with uh, physique development competitors or just clients in general, but. Yeah, I think competitors it is going to go by division, of course. Um, so within bikini athletes, this is something that I don't really touch a whole lot. I, I think that within, uh, the physique that we're seeking within the bikini is that, um, division is we're trying to see really good delt tissue, but we're not trying to see too much delt tissue. And so what's, what's transpiring at that point is that if we can keep the upper arm 
more slender, if you will. I don't love using that term, but yeah. um, that's Long the, the reality of it, <laughs> right? If we can keep it longer and leaner through the through the arm, and then have some really good pop through the delt, it's a it's going to accentuate the physique even greater. Because if we go in and we grow massive biceps, and and especially the uh, the, the brachialis specifically, where we're going to see the the long head of the bicep or the brachialis creating greater density, that's where we're going to run into some issues because that's going to really take away from the pop that that medial delt and the rear delt in that front shot is going to carry. And same thing with the tricep. So I'll have a little bit of tricep volume in there just because it is going to be something that we it could become an issue within some of our, our pressing motions for the delts if we are not training the triceps properly. Um, so I, I do carry that. And then from like any of our male divisions, this is going to be something that I'm programming you know, very heavily within all of them. Um, from a men's physique perspective, men's physique is becoming something that's bigger than classic. Like the athletes themselves are, are becoming They're bigger than- They're ginormous They're ginormous, man. Oh like the, the delts, everything. It's just like, just forget the lower body training session. We're just going to train upper as frequently as we possibly can. Um, and so within men's physique, that I mean, it's a huge component within that. Within classic, I'm not, it's not a, a massive piece of, of the puzzle um, because we have so much more to, to work on um, in, in general. I mean, classic is becoming, from a male perspective, my absolute favorite from a working with, with client perspective, just because I think that the balance that the category brings is such a, one, a beautiful physique, two, the most balanced of all the divisions at the moment. Um, I think that 212 can be that if the individual um, is of, of that structure, if you will, like 212 can be a, a balanced physique um, where you know, arm training, everything can be more balanced. But like somebody like Sean Clarita, where he's five foot four, you know, 212 or whatever, you know, height he is, he's just a, a bubbly monster within 212. So it doesn't look as, you know, streamlined or balanced, if you will, um, getting off on a side tangent from an arm volume perspective. But, um, and then you look at, you know, figure and, and you look at uh, wellness, those, those two, we're going to have a little bit of a volume, but it's not going to be a large priority uh, as delts are still going to be the, the large priority within those divisions as well. Yeah, which then expands into the question of, you know, are you having, from a program design perspective, are you having dedicated days or mm. are we working them in with other muscle groups? Obviously, there's a lot of a lot of caveats to this, but right. uh, what are you doing most often? Man, I, I think that with anyone who is having, it's like a large priority, especially within some of our male competitors, they do have a dedicated day. Um, I try to make it happen if possible on that front. For the female competitors that we work with, I don't think... I don't think I've ever used a, a full arm day because we have so much more to work on and so much glute volume mm -hmm. to, you know, get in and, and just lower. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I guess in that front, like for female competitors, are they going to have a, a dedicated glute day? Some, you know, could, uh, depending on all the different components that we have in place. But uh, for arms, no, I don't think I, I don't, I, I've. I don't even know if I've had a dedicated arm day in a long time, like I said earlier. Like, I don't remember the last time I had one. Yeah. And I, I was the same way for, for a very long time. And honestly, it's a blast. <laughs> it is. It's, so, it's fun. so much fun. <laughs> it's so fun. It's so much fun. It's, yeah. it's so much fun. Just go in and you're like, dude, let's rip. Let's get after it. And, you know, there's not a ton of what I love is like, I don't know. I know you and I both put a, we put a little pressure on ourselves to perform well and regardless of wherever this is going. For me, I understand it's not going anywhere um, as far as competitive natures, but what, what, you know, what I, I kind of carry from the old days is like, I feel kind of competitive with myself. I want to have a good session. Um, I, I want things to feel good and blah, blah, blah. So if I'm pressing or doing anything like bigger movement patterns, I'm, I'm, I put a little pressure on myself. Um, I think just to kind of keep myself in check and to make sure that I continue to care about it. Um, but it's probably its own safety mechanism, but <laughs> on arm day, it's like, dude, I just go in, no worry. Um, and it's like, let's go, you know, let's have a great pump. Let's, if I, you know, if I want to go lower reps, I'm going to, I'll hammer out some lower reps. If I want to go higher reps, I'm feeling shorter rest times, get a, you know, a nasty pump. I'm going to do that. So, um, I, I, some, a lot of times I combine, if I'm going to have a dedicated arm day. I usually just throw delts into the mix as well. Um, and have a dedicated arm and delts day. 
Uh, and I, I think with, for a lot of the, the guys that I train, um, some of the females that I train, I, you know, if they enjoy arms and delts a lot, um, or I wasn't able to sneak in much throughout the rest of the week and we have five days to train in the week, sometimes I will give, uh, my, my females, uh, that I work with a dedicated arm and delt day kind of also as like a deload of like, Hey, I want to get to the gym. I want to at least go to the gym. It's like, all right, well, I'm not touching all the main stuff. You know, I'm not touching everything we just obliterated the rest of the week. So I'm going to give you a day where it's kind of deloading the rest of that stuff and, and allowing you to to train those the, those muscle groups that we may not get a ton of. Um, and then if, you know, for males, you know, I'm, I'm definitely, um, I'm definitely, if I can sneak it in, I'm adding it because I know, I know they're enjoying it and, and it's a good time. So, well, if you're training five days a week, it's very difficult to not have like a shoulder and delt day or a, a delt and arm day, um, because of how, you know, just how thrashed you could be through the, the four sessions prior necessarily. Um, so yeah, I also, it can, it can break it up well too. Right. So some, you know, you can throw it in at the end of the week and throw it in, at, in the middle of the week. It's kind of dependent. Um, what I will say, if you are throwing it in, in the middle of the week, make sure your next session is lower body focused. Yeah. Because again, as we talked about earlier, you don't want to thrash your, you know, your, your upper arm, your biceps, triceps, delts, things like that. And then go straight into like a, you know, a push pull session or something. That's, you know, that's going to be atrocious. <laughs> that's yeah. not going to be great. No, thank you. Um, yeah. You're not going to feel very great. Things aren't going to move well. Uh, you're not going to feel very strong because a lot of those supporting tissues are f very fatigued still. Um, so, you know, if you do put it in the middle of the week, have a, um, have a leg day, maybe your a lower body focus day after that. Uh, and then that's a good way to put it. So my last question here, um, you know, we'll both kind of touch in on this, but what sort of reps and sets do you most use with arms? Uh, and does it depend on the exercise? Yeah, I, I think that, um, we touched on it a little bit within the, the bicep training within like the preacher curl and the facing away cable curl. Um, those are, are movements that I would prioritize lower rep ranges with, um, because I think that we can really up, you know, up the volume or up the poundage that we are able to utilize the intensity, uh, relative to what we'd be able to do within some of the other bicep movements. Like I'm not overly interested in doing a, um, a standing dumbbell curl with 50, 60 pound dumbbells and trying to get four repetitions with those. Like yeah, it may look cool for a photo shoot or something of that nature, but in terms of practicality from a day-to-day -day perspective, not super, uh, feasible. Um, within triceps, I think that this is one where I take to lower rep ranges more frequently than I do biceps just because of the different exercise selection and how well things line up as a whole, like with the, the cross cable tricep, uh, extension, and then also the, the facing away, uh, tricep extension as well. And so both of those you can load up quite well. It's just a matter of, can you get into positioning? Can you get the cable, you know, pulled down from the, to get it started? If you can get in positioning and actually execute awesome. If you have a training partner, it gets a lot easier. Um, I've been training in my garage by myself for the last two years. So I'm, um, you know, there's been some tough times getting into positioning for some of these more cable based movements where I can move a, a good bit of load. But, um, those would be ones I take down to lower rep ranges. Everything else is going to be in a kind of eight to 12 rep range. Even if I'm training you know, more strength based training as a whole, if I'm programming arm volume in there, I, st I still like six to eight is still the, the ballpark that I would be in with a lot of the arm volume that would be in there as well. Yeah, that's a good meaty, uh, rep range. And I will say too, it's going to add to what you were saying. The, <clears throat> the more intense, right. The exercise is going to be the more stability we're going to need. Right. And so that, that starts to make a lot of sense and the lower the reps sort of said differently, the lower the reps are, the more stability we really rely on in those exercises to produce the amount of tension needed um, and you know to get a full range of motion in terms of getting a full rep in, um, feeling stable and, and producing that much intensity and tension, uh, you need a lot of stability. And so 
choosing exercises you feel very stable in or that stabilize well, like the cable-based movements we mentioned. Um, and, and that is to say some free weights aren't, aren't uh, usable, but I would say cable-based or machine-based movements are probably a little bit more apt to help the situation a little bit more and, and further along the goal of those sessions and the goal of those reps and sets and all of that stuff. So that rounds it out, man. I, I think that's it for us. I, we're right at an hour. I think we right, crushed it. Right on the dot, yeah. Right on the dot, which is, I think that's pretty good for us, really. Yeah, I'll take so, it as a win. Take it as a win. All right, we'll sign off. We'll say bye. We'll keep it under an hour. Um, we're right at an hour, rather. Uh, and so we'll say our bye. We have nine seconds, so I'm going to say bye <laughs> before we hit an hour. So see you guys. See, see you next ya. time.